On the Tuesday, we marched 30,000 people to Parliament to protest against Nelson Mandela's legalization of pornography, prostitution, homosexuality, and all these other evils. And that was on the Tuesday, and I was summoned to the President's home on the Thursday. And I went there, and uh, he gave me a full hour, and he was very gracious, very charismatic. I could tell that this man is um, polished when it comes to handling the media and uh, uh, the press, and um, he said, we are responsive to the concerns of your constituency, and he, he, my door's always open to you, and so he, he was gracious and all of that. But one of the things that he said right at the beginning was, so, Mr. Hammond, what were you doing in the years of struggle? So I said, I was fighting people like you, sir. And he laughed and said, I'm so glad to meet an honest white man. He reached out and shook my hand again, laughing away. He said, all the whites I've met so far have said how they always supported me and opposed apartheid. I wondered how the National Party stayed in power for all those years when everyone supported me. So I said, well, make no mistake, Mr. President, we were not fighting for apartheid. We were fighting against communism and against terrorism. So he leaned back and he said, apartheid was the greatest evil in the history of the world. So I said, well, I cannot agree with that, Mr. President. I think that prize must go to your friends and supporters, the communists. The 20th century is littered with the corpses of 160 million people, conservative estimate, not killed in war by foreign governments, killed in peace by their own people. I'm talking about 160 million people, civilians, murdered by secular humanist, atheistic, Marxist regimes in the 20th century. Now, he's still silent, so I carried on. And I said, that includes the 36 million people slaughtered under Joseph Stalin in the Soviet Union, the 68 million killed by Mao Zedong in Red China, the two to three million killed under Pol Pot's Khmer Rouge in Cambodia. And I worked my way through the Red Terror under Mengistu in Ethiopia and Samora Michelle in Mozambique and Agustin Neto in Angola and went all the way through to Fidel Castro, his personal friend in Cuba. He sat there impassively. And after I catalogued this series of horror stories on the Black Book of Communism and what Alexander Solzhenitsyn and others have said about the Soviet Union and the communist carnage, he leaned backwards and stared into the ceiling and he started to take a trip down memory lane. And he spoke about when he was a prisoner of the Boers on Robben Island. They wouldn't allow him to wear sunglasses. And he said, my eyes are very sensitive and it's very painful to go in the sun without sunglasses. I said, Mr. President, I fully understand and I can appreciate my eyes are very sensitive and I can imagine how incredibly uncomfortable that must have been. But, sir, you must admit that hardly compares with the kind of atrocities documented by Alexander Solzhenitsyn in the Gulag Archipelago. And, of course, Nelson Mandela had admitted in TV and radio interviews that he is never tortured. Now there he was, a man who had admitted in open court, pleaded guilty, and remember he is trained as a lawyer, he pleaded guilty to 156 acts of public violence and terrorism. He is the head of the revolutionary terrorist wing of the ANC, Umkuntu Wisiswi, and he was behind so many different operations from the planting of bombs in the railway station, which killed women and children, which crippled people, bombs in shopping centers, attacks on farmers, uh, uh, so many acts of violence. You know, this new film Invictus, which portrays him out to be a modern saint, it never mentions why he wasn't present. But not even the Amnesty International would take his case because they said he wasn't a political prisoner. He had had a fair trial and a reasonable sentence. He'd had his day in court. He was not a political prisoner. He is in jail for acts of violence. And I might add, in 1964, when he was sentenced, he would have been hung in Britain or electrocuted in America for the same offenses because both Britain and America had capital punishment back in the 60s. For the crimes that he was given life imprisonment for in South Africa, he would have got the death sentence for in any other country. In fact, at the time in 1964, the South African judiciary was being praised by the most liberal newspapers like the Daily Mail uh, worldwide for such a lenient sentence because they knew he deserved more. And Nelson Mandela, people say, oh, Nelson Mandela is so forgiving and uh, gracious. Well, he didn't have anything to forgive because he had been given very fair treatment. He hadn't even been mistreated during his time in prison. It's an extraordinary thing to be a revolutionary who had violently tried to overthrow the country that killed so many people, being head of the revolutionary group, to say that after 26 years in prison, he had never been tortured. Couldn't point to any case like that. You couldn't have a prison anywhere in Africa. I've been a prisoner for a couple of weeks in a few communist countries. 
we were being tortured within the first day. It, it's just unheard of in any of those prisons that a person could be treated that well and survive that long. But that aside, we came back to discussing the whole issues of his policies. And Nelson Mandela was uh, talking about racism and apartheid and how could Christians of the past have supported it. I said, Mr. President, you are questioning the Christianity of people who 40 years ago justified apartheid. But it won't be 40 years from now and people will question your humanity for legalizing abortion. You have replaced apartheid with abortion and abortion is worth it. You have replaced discrimination on the basis of race with discrimination on the basis of age. And you're not just limiting as to where this child can live or which voters role the child can be on. You are taking away the child's right to life. With taxpayers' money, you are legislating this child's right to life away so that the babies can be killed. This is worse than apartheid. You're separating a baby from its mother and killing the baby. History will judge you harshly, Mr. President, unless you reverse this legislation and protect the most innocent, the most helpless citizens of all, pre-born babies, from the violence and the injustice of abortion. And we bounced backwards and forwards uh, on, on this level for quite a while. Well, at one point, we'd been going an hour, Nelson Mandela stood up and said, you may take your photographs now. Now, we didn't mean to be rude and I really hadn't thought about it, but uh, I said, no, thank you. And he, his mouth dropped open, jaw gaping. He looked shocked. Maybe we were the first people that he met that didn't want to have their photographs taken with him, but that wasn't why we were there. I said, but we would like to pray for you, Mr. President. And he said, no, that, that's very private, I'd rather not. And Reverend Sue and Sevenster and I pretended we hadn't heard and we each put a hand on our shoulder and we prayed. Lord Jesus, may you not give Mr. Mandela one moment's rest, may you not give him any peace until he does what he knows is right and that he introduces legislation to protect pre-born babies from the violence and injustice of abortion. Lord Jesus, do not let Mr. Mandela rest until he has bowed the knee to you as King Jesus and surrenders life to you. We prayed along this line. Well, when he finished, you could tell that he was probably simmering, but he was very calm on the exterior. Thank you, Mr. Hammond. I'm always open to your concerns. My door is always open to you. Well, that was Thursday. We'd marched on Tuesday. We met him on Thursday. Monday morning, two senior special investigators of the Inland Revenue Service knocked on the door of our mission and began a seven-year audit of myself, my wife, all of our ministries, our mission going back seven years and they continued for six years. It was 13 years audit ultimately in the end. We had to get special tax specialist accountants to help us employ another person. And it was the most petty audit our people had ever seen. And we had tax specialists say they had never in their lives seen such a petty audit and such high level people. And our mission is a small scale operation. In the scheme of things, we, we were, we were absolutely uh, nothing in, uh, of, of importance. And yet they persisted, obviously because the president had set his dogs on us. So he's charming to our face, but he tried to destroy us uh, through these tax audits. And I might add, at the end of covering 13 years, they found we didn't owe them a thing. There wasn't one thing. So all that manpower was consumed and they, all they proved was our books were in order and we were truly tax exempt organization that had no profit and there was, we'd always filed the right tax returns and there was nothing out of order that they could point to. And that was our experience with Nelson Mandela. Charming, but he set his dogs on us.